I am Rabbi Michael Sachs. Welcome um, one of the rabbis here. Before the main uh, program starts, which will be down the stairs, but I'll take us all down there, uh, I want to welcome you to Holy Blossom and teach a little bit about the Holy Blossom Temple and about uh, the space we're in and, and maybe our, our renovated spaces too and answer uh, any, any of your questions. Um, but here we are. This is our main sanctuary, which was built in 1938, uh, before really the Jewish community moved up here uh, to this area of town, which is farmland, a few houses. Uh, but Holy Blossom Temple has been around since 1856, which makes us the oldest Jewish congregation in Ontario. Um, we, so people often ask, how did we get the kind of odd name, Holy Blossom? But it comes from a, the official name of the congregation is the Toronto Hebrew Congregation. And then it has the secondary name in Hebrew, Pirkei Kodesh, which means blossoms of holiness, holy blossoms. And where did that word come, where did that word come from? In a, uh, a Jewish text uh, called the Mishnah, about 2,000 years old, the people who were training for the priesthood in Jerusalem were called Pirkei Kuna, the blossoms of the priesthood. And the priests were the ones who did the holy work in Jerusalem, so that's where they think this phrase came from, Pirkei Kodesh, the holy, the, kind of the trainees for holiness, the holy blossoms. Pereth is also a blossom of flower. And somehow, the word got Englishized and dropped the, the plural and just became holy blossoms. Blossoms. So, uh, welcome to Holy Blossom. In 1938, when we built this sanctuary in the middle of the Depression, they didn't know the Jews would move to this uh, uh, part of town, so it became kind of prophetic when they decided to buy this land and build this synagogue. And you can tell, if you've been in other synagogues in town, it's very different than most synagogues in this part of town. If you go to a like, there's a few uh, buildings that are still synagogues downtown. Might look a little more like a smaller, probably, but this looked very much like a pre-World War II architecture. Uh, much more like a European synagogue if you would go to a synagogue that's still around in Hungary or, or Czechoslovakia or in, in Germany. And uh, stained glass windows and a dome and um, a balcony, things like that. Yeah. Some people often point out that our synagogue, do you know which way we're facing right now? East. We're not facing east. <laughs> this synagogue faces west. Now, it, some people think that it's Jewish law that a synagogue has to face east towards Jerusalem. It's not, it's not strict Jewish law that you have to face east. It is, um, it's a, a, a custom. But why does our synagogue face west? Now, some people guess it's because they were liberals when they built the synagogue and they wanted to say that now our home is here in the West and not in the East. To make like an ideological statement, that could be. But it was probably because they bought this piece of property and they wanted the main doors open up on the bathroom which were right there. <laughs> the same thing, you just go around the world. Right, there you go. Yes, the world is round and eventually East, West is all relative. It's like Columbus. Besides find Far East, you went West. Exactly, exactly. So, the synagogue base is West, but uh, there are other synagogues in town. There's one other synagogue I know of in town that's an Orthodox synagogue near here that faces West also, or doesn't face East, I'm not sure it faces West. Um, do you have, uh, as you can see, around the synagogue, there's different strange glass windows. Now, the, uh, the, the myth is, I don't know if it's true, some people, some of our old timers claim it, it's definitely true that they commissioned Chagall to uh, do the stained glass windows, but he was too abstract and too, and too expensive. So uh, they, they, I think it's a Canadian artist, but you can see that um, each window has a, a different theme, and uh, uh, it's good that we're here, but it's still light up because you can see them. So this one, the theme, it's an octut, which means unity, but it has, uh, it's, depiction of like the God calling Abraham <coughs> and it's a be thou a blessing and be Abraham's called me a blessing to the world. But then it has uh, at the end kind of uh, or at the bottom kind of 
refugee Jews. The Jews are always wandering with Abraham. Here we have Moses, half the Torah. Uh, Torah, this is our way of revelation. Um, there is the prophet Isaiah. Says to do shot of holiness. Um, we go around and uh, there's window over here is um, Chokmah, Chokmah means wisdom, and I think that uh, Yochanan ben Zakkai, who was an early rabbi, there's one in the corner uh, about his philosophy, philosophia, and has the Rambam, who was a, a well-known uh, Jewish philosopher, rabbi in medieval uh, Egypt, in Muslim Egypt. Uh, over here we have one for, a, there's also one for, um, uh, that has Moses Mendelssohn, who was a famous, uh, in the late 18th century, was a Jewish philosopher in Germany. He was about, uh, I think, symbolizing integration into Western society. We have one with Leo Beck, who was a famous uh, German rabbi over here that uh, survived the Holocaust, the dedication of the Holocaust. This one over here says, Tikva, Pol. And I think it's really about uh, kind of modern times of different peoples coming together to, uh, to uh, to bring the world together, to lit hakein olam, the malchut shadai, to to uh, repair the world under God's sovereignty. And then we have other windows of holidays dedicated to our older buildings. One dedicated to the United Nations over there, uh, up on the balcony there. You can't see it. Um, any any questions? Or yes. Why is the menorah be Hanukkah instead of a regular menorah? Right. So where the top? Why is it a Okay, good. So, uh, over the ark, so the space up there is called the ark Aron in Hebrew, meaning kind of like a closet where we keep our Torahs. I'll show you that in a minute. But above it, way up, there is a, a, a relief of a, a menorah, which means a lamb. And it has uh, nine branches on it. I, I'm going to make a guess. I don't know for sure. So, in the ancient temple, they had seven branch, they had a seven branched menorah like these ones, the electric ones there. But there is a custom in synagogues not to have a depiction of the seven branch menorah because only in the temple would you have that. So that might be why they have it there or it would be a symbol of Hanukkah, I'm not sure. Hanukkah is a, a, a holiday where we have a seven branch lamp or a nine branch lamp. Um, I'm not sure. But that is probably because before they put these in, which break that custom. They did it like that because you're not supposed to have one that looks exactly like the menorah in Jerusalem. Yeah. The Hebrew under is the Dali Nei. Is that what it says? Yeah. Dali Nei Yahav Omei, know before whom you stand. So it's a, it's a statement of, of humility that, that you look at when you, some of the central prayers in, in the prayer service, you kind of focus towards the ark, and I think that's there as a, as a statement of humility. And under that is a depiction of the Ten Commandments, and then we have our ark, which I will, uh, I'm going to take out the Torah, and then in our last few minutes, I'm going to bring one, bring it on the table, and then you can all come by and see, okay? So why don't we come on up to the, this area, and this is the lower one at all, and the other raised area in a synagogue. Really, Jews can create anywhere, but if you have a dedicated building for a synagogue, what you really all you need is a place to hold the Torahs and a place to read the Torahs. And I'll show you. So come on up here. Specifically means just the scrolls in the first five books of the Bible. And we we dress them up with with uh, beautiful uh, beautiful garments crowns like the ancient uh, priests would wear. This is more of a contemporary looking one. So. Now, most Jewish books that we use, like prayer books or other works of, of Jewish law that we study are printed in books. But a Torah, from ancient age, from the ancient times, there was discussion, can we use in our services liturgically a Torah that's in a book. And they said, no, we have to use it in a scroll like our ancestors did. So you will see, hey, come close. So you can see it's, it's 
written by hand. Just we don't touch the uh, the ink because there are oils in our fingers won't make it run. This is made from it's written by hand with a feather quill with a special kind of ink, and it takes about a year to write a whole Torah scroll. And then when you're when you're chanting from it, you do it uh, with a uh, a pointer. But this is a contemporary pointer. Some pointers have a little finger on them because we call the pointer a yad, which means a, a hand. And so every week. Uh, on Shabbat, on Saturday morning, you read a portion of the Torah. In the fall, you start in the beginning, and by the end of the summer, you finish, and then you start back over. On Mondays and Thursday mornings, you also read uh, a little bit of the weekly portion, and then on the holidays, there are special portions to read. So this is uh, this uh, Shabbat, the Saturday is this is where we're reading right here. Mm. We're starting right here, um, and there's a special chant uh, to chant the. The Torah and different Jewish communities around the world have a different sound to their chant. Let me see if I can. Can someone reach in? Can you reach me a chumash? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I don't. So the person who chants this is a prayer book. This is a Torah commentary here. The person who chants the Torah, there's a special chant for it, and, and you have to memorize how the chant goes for the week because ancient Hebrew didn't have punctuation and didn't and Hebrew since about the early Middle Ages has had marks in it and books that tell you how to pronounce each word but the ancient Torah did not have that so what you do is you would have a book that would tell you how to pronounce all the words of the weekly portion and then you would memorize that and and chant it so I will go I'll, I'll chant a few few words of this week's portion uh, from uh, and then that knowing that I did not memorize it, I'm looking at it before. Okay. Uh, just to give you a taste of how it sounds. And um, so what the person would do is they would be chanting along here, but someone would be standing next to them with a book a printed book to make sure they're doing everything correctly and then, and then uh, uh, correcting them if they mess up. Now some congregations, people from the, the, the congregation will also correct them. <laughs> that is rude, but everybody does it anyway. In fact, they're not supposed to do that. Only the person standing next to them. So, so it goes, Im b'chu kotahai t'lechu b'mitzvotahai t'ishmeru v'asitem otahai so I chanted from, from here to here. Okay. So, any questions? Yeah, why, why was this uh, uh, put in French and where was it? Uh, this tour specifically? Yes, please. Uh, this one is pretty new. They commissioned it a few years ago. Um, but we have Torahs here that go back, you know, over 100, 100 years. What's yeah. it made of? So it is made of, I'm not sure specifically this one, but a Torah scroll can be made out of any, a skin of any kosher animal. So a cow, a sheep, a, a goat, a deer, a giraffe. But not, not paper. Uh, no, not paper, no. So you could, you could feel it, it's kind of fuzzy. Right? Rabbi Satz, can yeah. you translate what you just chanted? Yeah. <laughs> Small detail. So it says, uh, so it, where this week's the last, um, the last Torah portion of the book of Vayikra, which is the book of Leviticus, the third book of the Torah. And it, you know, much of Vayikra is about the laws that of the temple service and the people who served in the temple in Jerusalem. 
So um, I'll, I'm going to read the translation here. That um, we're very proud that this is the the Torah commentary that Reformed Jews around the world use. That was put together here at Holy Blossom by uh, Gunther Plout, who was our longtime rabbi. So if you follow my laws faithfully and observe my commandments, so the name of the portion of this week is the Chukotai, which means my laws. The name usually comes from the first important word of the, of the verse. Uh, I will grant you rains in their season so that the earth, so, uh, I'll grant you rain in the season so that the earth shall yield its produce and the trees yield their fruit. Your threshing shall overtake the vintage and your vintage shall overtake the sowing. You shall eat your fill of bread and dwell securely in your land. So that's what I chanted. There you go. Good. Any other questions? How do you follow, like, when you, for next week's, for example, you read this and then which side do you? Yeah. Let's keep going. So okay, next yeah. week we start, here's where the next book of the Torah starts, this is the gap. So uh -huh. Next week is Bamidvar, which is the next book. So once you're done, you like, scroll back. Scroll all the way back, yeah. So that's why we have several Torah scrolls around. So, like, for a holiday where you read a portion that might be somewhere in the middle, off of where you're reading in the week, you grab another Torah instead of having to scroll all the way through. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, you explained the difference between the scroll and a book. Yeah. Nowadays, yeah. Uh, we have computers yeah. and apps, yeah. and it's a different kind of a tablet. Yeah. So, uh, how does one read on the little devices that we have? It's a blessing that we can't. <laughs> what, what do you mean, how does, what, I don't understand. Uh, like, uh, as a Muslim, like, yeah. there was initially questions of, we're taking the Quran and we're putting it on yeah. on, on the computer, yeah. and do you have to I'll do a blue, and do you have to wash? I my, uh, my phone and read anything in Jewish literature for the last 2,000 years, pretty much. But, at the same time, we still have an older technology than books, right, here, that we use every week, right? So, so that's, that's kind of Judaism in a nutshell, that you... Uh, you adapt and keep at the same time, right? So I'm going to put this away, and I'm going to ask everybody, because uh, I, I've kept you too long, to start heading downstairs, and you can go by the spiral staircase or the... Um,